for that. Another thing I want to point out is the respite program um, now has signups. So whether you would like to be part of the club or um, and you need and with the respite care or you want to volunteer, now is the time to be filling out that paperwork. It's been coming out every Tuesday in your email. Um, I think the link is right here, also on the back of your page. Um, and then they'll be having training in the fall. So that's why now is the time to volunteer. In August, yeah. To me that's the fall, but that's like next week. Okay, so it's, and training is in August. So very important to sign up now if you're interested in all. And interest might mean volunteering every week. Interest might mean volunteering every month. Interest might mean that you want to come and share one of your hobbies, whatever that might look like. Now is the time to apply. All right, what have I missed? Yes, Anne. Oh, yes. I have a job announcement to make for people. Oh, First of all, thank you for your, your contributions to the backpacks, and you'll see them sitting up front. We're packing them with the children this morning. But MAPA is trying to fill a 20 hour a week position in the afternoons. It's after school care. It's going to pay $20 an hour. If you're interested, please contact me. I've got all the information and they really need somebody. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, the kids are going to be packing backpacks, but I'm going to talk to the kids about that. Anything else? God is good. All the time. Let us worship. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we come to you like ragged, jagged rocks. In your word today, through spoken, through preached, through music, pour your water upon us, smoothing our edges. May we leave as changed people, ready to serve, remembering who we serve. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Please join me in the call to worship. All your work shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. You open your hands, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just and kind. The Lord is dear to all who call God. Let, Let us, us worship, worship God. God. Let us stand and sing together. Let us turn our hearts to confession. Merciful God, you have commanded us to love you above all and to have no other gods. You have called us to love others as you love them, but we are personally and socially deformed by the love of other gods, the false gods of prosperity and materialism, of racial and ethnic privileging, of gender exclusivity, and of nationalistic imperialism. Forgive us our sins and transform us by your spirit that we might learn to love as you love and to live as people who have been baptized as your own children. Amen.
brothers and sisters in Christ, hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. So let us rise and give glory to God. God's love with one another in our pews, I ask the children to come down.
Now you go and you work very diligently because I think how many do they have to fill? Testament lesson for this morning comes from the book of 2 Kings. Listen for the word of the Lord. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elisha said, give it to the people and let them eat. 
But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, give it to the people and let them eat, for thus says the Lord. They shall eat and have some left. He set it before them, they ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. The New Testament lesson for this morning is for the, from the Gospel of John. Listen for the word of God. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted him to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. The word for today. So our God has always been a God of abundance, offering us the opportunity to live lives filled with love and grace, forgiveness, without fear, and with a concept of what a good life actually means. You might sometimes hear that there is a God of the Old Testament and a God of the New Testament, but that's not true because God never changes. God is consistent, even when we humanly cannot understand how God works. In fact, it would do us a lot of good to spend time in the Old Testament and really study who God is there so we could see the same similarities in the New Testament. Because God is the one who leads his people to freedom. The God who hears people's pain. The God who chooses people who are far from perfect to lead because it's not about them. It's about God. In the stories of Moses or David, Samuel, Isaac, Rahab, Ruth, Miriam, Leah, Zipporah, and Esther, just to name a few, we can find flawed people who excelled because they decided to trust God over their own instincts. Some beg God not to choose them. Choose another. We're not worthy. And that is the truth. No one is worthy. 
but God is worthy. So here in the New Testament and the Old Testament, we hear basically the same story of God offering miraculous feedings. The meager bread is able to feed everyone with leftovers. So why do you think God is so insistent on teaching us this same lesson over and over? That there is enough for all. That we do not need to hold on to ourselves so tightly, instead seek the welfare of all. That we, when we work in God's will, can offer miraculous generosity. That there really will be enough bread with more to spare. And as you know, Lee and I just finished our 14-day trip across Europe where we encountered some terrible history of how good people can easily be led astray when the focus becomes inward and self-focused. We went to Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. When fear and self-protection -protect win over compassion and reason, when the desire for power and wealth wins over common sense, and how scary it is that when we don't pay attention, our own baser instincts might win, and will probably win. We learned about the Habsburg family, who ruled over parts of Europe for over 800 years, keeping their wealth and power intact by marrying their first cousins, by keeping it all in the family. But the result of all that inbreeding were these jutting jaws, right? They, they jutted out so far with some of these people that they couldn't even close their mouth to eat. There's a good reason we don't marry our first cousins. <laughs> they also had mental, um, mental uh, instability. We also visited a concentration camp, and let me tell you, when we all came out of that camp, nobody said a word. It was just too difficult. How could that happen? And in plain sight. In Vienna, we met a man who has made it his life's work to create a museum documenting how Austria was complicit in the rise of Hitler. And as you might know, Austria is actually where Hitler came from. But Austria as a country has decided not to embrace their history, but in, in, instead to kind of whitewash it. So this man created this me museum. And in it, he talks again and again about how the American Marshall Plan, with its generosity, was the main reason Vienna could thrive again after the war. The plan's goals were to help rebuild war-damaged cities, industries, infrastructure, remove trade barriers between European countries, increase commerce between Europe and the US. Generosity upon generosity, indicative of the lesson of sharing our wealth, the loaves and fishes of today. And for you history buffs, this was a learned lesson from after World War I, when um, the result of forced war reparations and the suffering that ensued gave a foothold for the rise of nationalism and fascism, the them versus us mentality. People were beaten down, starving, no jobs. It was so, no wonder that a leader who promised prosperity and me first was so attractive. A person who placed the blame for the pain of the war not on themselves and not on their decisions as a country, but instead on others. In the 40s, the blame went to the Jewish population, those with disabilities the Romani people, the gypsies, homosexuals. And all of this managed to, to draw the support of the average person because it made them feel all of this stuff that's happening to us, this hunger, no jobs, well, it's not our fault, it's someone else's fault, someone else's doing. So after the Second World War, help was given. Not only the Marshall Plan, but also private help. Again, loaves and fishes, generosity always wins the day. On display, Gerhard, who's the owner of the museum, had care boxes that were dropped full of food to the starving people at the um, end of the Second War. These care boxes were filled and donated by individuals in America. For $10 a box, 
They could be sent to a specific person. And in fact, President Truman sent out the first care box. Does anyone remember this? Care guaranteed delivery within four months to anyone in Europe, even if they had left, the, they had left their known address. They didn't know where they lived. They expected a return signed delivery receipt. And because European postal services were unreliable at the time, this was the only way sometimes that people found out that their loved one was still alive. But can you see the loaves and fishes concept working here? How generosity and love, giving, can and does make a huge difference as opposed to war reparations. Generosity. God and Jesus knew exactly what they were teaching us, and it was important. We are not meant to live with this I mentality, but instead with a we mentality. We are one across this world. That's how the kingdom of heaven works. Love your neighbor as yourself is a commandment that pays dividends. And that is so hard for us humans to accept because it cedes the power to God and not to ourselves and our own human desires. Because we naturally worry about ourselves. Will we have enough? Will there be enough? Who is worthy enough? But the fact is, that is not ours to decide because it all belongs to God. Elisha's servant asked, how can I set this before a hundred people? Philip said, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. Those are human thoughts. And God said, watch me work. Allow me to work through your trust. Follow me. Luke 6.38 reminds us, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. See, these are not mere words, but a road map for living. The story of the loaves and the fishes has been played out so many times in history, where love and compassion and generosity have proved themselves to be the answer to pain and selfishness and control. So another place, you guys are traveling with me now, Lee and I visited was the home in the office of Sigmund Freud, who lived before the war in Vienna. In the apartment is displayed a letter written to Albert Einstein. In the early 1930s, the Committee on Intellectual Cooperation in Paris encouraged great minds to talk with one another or to correspond. So Freud and Einstein did. And Einstein's letter begins with this question. Is there any way of delivering mankind from the menace of war? And Freud, in his answer, said, the inborn human tendency towards aggression is to be confronted. Whatever makes for cultural development is also working against war. That was in 1933. In other words, we are reminded that our first tendency towards self-protection, or me, 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 should be confronted. Does this not follow God's commandment to love one another? to give without reserve, to think of the other first. God will provide in abundance. Only love can and will win hearts. Because the world is, the world will always be a tumultuous place. But God does not leave us to deal with it alone. We are, of course, entering into a time where we will need to focus and to allow generosity of heart to win the day generosity of spirit, to check ourselves against our basic instincts. So I found this on an anonymous post on the Unvirtuous Abbey, which is something I follow, and I want to share it with you. Instructions on living in a broken world. Lean into community. Seek out love. Applaud the good you see. Keep paying attention. Talk to your neighbors. Dance to the music. Embrace art. Look for love and small joys. Take breaks and relish in nourishing your body. Donate what you can. Linger at the dinner table with friends. Check in with your people. Let yourself grieve. 
Love one another as deeply as you can. The storm is upon us and we must hold on. Don't give up, we're all in it together. And I would add, our Lord teaches us, then Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing might be lost. So they gathered them up and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. God works in abundance. Let us work in abundance as well. Trust in him whose love never fails. Amen. joys and concerns today. Is there a hand? Oh! <laughs> Sorry. As long as I'm moving out, it's our joy and concern. The concern is that I always look at women before starting to be <laughs> And the joy is that the inevitable mother, Joan Humphrey, is back here this week from all being here all last summer. <laughs> and the other joy is that my sister Foster Frable or sitting next to my husband Mike. And just to put the blame on partially her, I she took flute, I played flute, she took voice lessons, I took voice lessons. Yeah. <laughs> so we share that. Wonderful. And next time you can join in. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have a joy. My daughter Wendy is here with her husband Mike. Yay. Hey, good to see you. Yay! Yes, Kathy. Um, I have a prayer concern for my sister, um, who sharing. She has a severe case of COVID. Is not here. Okay. We keep Sherry in our prayers for full healing. Yes. I would ask us to remember the people of Jasper, Alberta, yeah. whose lives have been totally devastated by the Canadian wildfire. When I was in university, I worked summers at Jasper Park College and am so familiar with the beauty of that area and that precious little town. And it's just up anyway to see what it's like now. So prayers for Jasper, Alberta, and the victim of, victims, both people and animals, of all those wildfires. Yeah. Yes. I think it's for prayers for my daughter's closest friend growing up. She's in Atlanta. She's in Emory Hospital right now. She's 54 years old and in stage four 
sarcoma, and uh, they've done surgery yesterday to try to stop some internal bleeding. Prayers for your family, for her family and her friends. Her name is Callie? Callie. Callie. Prayers for Callie and her family. Yes. Don Lund is having knee surgery tomorrow morning. So remember him and Carol. Pray for prayers for Don for knee surgery tomorrow. Yes, Kathy. Prayers for my cousin Alice, who is stage three lung cancer in a nursing facility and getting ready for chemo treatment. Prayers for Alice and her family, and your family, um, as she is struggling with stage three lung cancer. Well, we have the joy that we actually are getting some rain. My weeds are growing again, so that's, they're green at least, I keep telling Lee, so. So that is a joy. Yes. Enjoy the cultural exchange she was preaching about through the Olympics. I thought the opening four-hour ceremony was just worth staying up until umpteen hours for. <laughs> and to think about the exchange personally, not just the competition between nations, but the personal exchange between those athletes who are privileged to be there. Yes, it's very exciting. Swimming is doing really well. <laughs> Anything else? All right, let's turn to God. Gracious Lord, you are such a God of abundance. And yet sometimes, Lord, we just forget that. And we cling to our own thoughts. We cling to our own teachings. We cling to ourselves. And then, Lord, we come and we hear your word again and again. And you remind us it's not about us. It is, in fact, about others. It is, in fact, about love and diversity and inclusion. Lord, when we think about these loaves and fishes, let us remi be reminded that the only way to really make all this work, Lord, is to be like you, to forgive, to show kindness, to show compassion, to show love, again and again, to remind ourselves of who you are and who we can be, too. Lord, many of our loved ones might be ill. And you said to the families and to those who were ill that all will be well. Lord, we pray that you give us the words of encouragement when we meet those who are suffering. Give us strong hearts and courage to be the ones who are strong. Lord, we give thanks for these Olympics, a time for people from all over the world to gather and to try to do their best. May this time be a lesson to us of what can happen when people put their differences aside. And in our silence, Lord, we lift up all of those prayers that we have for you.
Hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All that we have and all that we are is a gift of God, so let us collect the offering.
I promise that will be a song worm in your head today. <laughs> so as we go out, let us remember to always be examples of grace, of love, of generosity. And when our heart begins to harden or we begin to get angry, let us stop ourselves and remember the great gift that Jesus Christ was to us and that we can be for others. Grace, generosity, and love always win. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you his peace. Go out and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you.